Good. All right, everyone. Welcome to AAF Let's Make Lemonade. Uh, how'd you get into that? Where we're talking with four folks who uh, are from various uh, niches in the design world about their journeys, things that are interesting about their career paths, and just sharing some of their insights with you guys. Um, so uh, before we get started, I did want to mention that we have uh, our next upcoming event, uh, Creative Zen, 9 a.m. on uh, Friday, May 14th, um, which is coming up soon. Uh, Creative Zen, like all of our events uh, this year, are is free uh, and open to everybody. Um, and it'll probably be the first one that we go back to in person, but we've got um, a really cool speaker, Tevin Ali, who's going to be joining us for that session. So definitely encourage you guys to hit our website and sign up for that. Uh, and uh, also wanted to mention that AAF is getting ready to head into our new fiscal year, which means that we are recruiting for our next board and set of committee members. So if you're interested in joining AAF and being part of um, our committees and putting on cool events like this and doing other stuff, um, please get in touch with us. I'll put my email in the chat so that it's accessible to everybody and definitely reach out. Happy to answer questions uh, or anything else. <clears throat> okay, so without further ado, I want to let our uh, panelists for tonight introduce themselves. And Brian, I think we'll start with you since you're first on my screen here. Okay. Um, my name is Brian Cavanaugh. I'm a freelance toy designer. I've been in the toy business for, oh my goodness, uh, over 30 years. I've been freelancing for a little over 20. And um, I suppose as the evening wears on, you, you can, we'll all learn more about each other. But um, you know, I've 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 spent time uh, in the corporate side of things uh, as a as a designer, a manager, and a director. And uh, nowadays, um, work with um, most of the major toy companies, developing uh, all kinds of stuff. Since I'm the first one, I don't really know how much I should say. <laughs> All right, Nicole, you're up next. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Ford. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, California. I'm a scenic artist. Um, and a scenic artist is traditionally someone who paints backdrops for theater and live events. But right now I work at uh, Mattel building and painting sets for their uh, various brands and commercials, photo shoots, web series and trade shows. Um, I've been a scenic artist for about 10 years um, and I have taken the non-traditional route. Um, I have done a lot of corporate stuff, a lot of live events, um, some theme parks and yeah, that's me. All right, Hiram, you're up. All right, my name is Hiram Enriquez. I'm down in Miami, Florida, uh, specifically Doral. Um, I am a, I'm considered a creative director for my graphic design studio, but I also uh, lecture at the University of Miami, visual design and infographics and data visualization. My background pretty much, I fell into design through journalism. So I, in, in college, I took journalism classes and graphic design classes. Um, I joined the student newspaper because I needed an artist. Um, I did internships at the Miami Herald, Detroit Free Press, Dallas Morning News. Ended up working full-time in the news art department of the Miami Herald for 14 years. 14 of those years, uh, six of those years, I was a graphics editor. Then I went to the South Florida Sun Sentinel for roughly three and a half years to learn 3D illustration, which was one of my passions. And, um, and then National Geographic came calling and I went to work for National Geographic for roughly over two years. And then um, I got laid off and decided that I wanted to just per continue being a freelancer. And I've been doing that since late 2009. Got my MFA in 2014 and been teaching full time for, for the last six years and doing freelance graphic design work. All right, that's me left, right? Yep. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Luke. 
uh, Luke Hurd, and um, I am the uh, innovation director for a firm in Kansas City uh, called Signal Theory, which specializes in um, like human behavior, trying to tackle things from more of a human centric point of view. So um, I got my start um, in my odd little world um, a long, long time ago. Um, I was an artist and learned how to program because I saw the potential of what the internet could be. Um, and learned uh, layout, I should say, the HTML uh, markup type stuff, and um, fell kind of backwards into a career doing programming. And uh, but I did it really early on. So I built some of the first websites uh, out there in the world, like uh, Bank of America and um, Kodak, Sony, RealEstate.com. Man, so many like weird, weirdly odd, big sounding names now, but. Um, all those sites are in the dust now, long time ago. <clears throat> and um, I really got drawn into advertising and marketing. Uh, I'm just seeing how people use things because I used to work with um, <clears throat> a group uh, and an uh, agency called Sapient um, and a group called XMOD, which is uh, experience modeling. And that's where we really started learning how people use websites around 1998 or so. And that's where I started really kind of falling in love with that. And uh, right now I... Um, specialize in, uh, in augmented reality because I see a lot of parallels to the same growth uh, and same kind of career paths in those uh, spaces. So uh, that's what I do right now. And um, I build augmented reality experiences for uh, National Geographic as well. Uh, NASA, um, some pretty crazy things. I'm a little astonished that I get to say out loud, but um, yeah, it's great, great stuff. Right on. Well, those, those are our panelists and a little bit of the origin story for each of them. I do want to mention as we go, guys, feel free to put any questions in the chat and I will be uh, monitoring that so I can kind of roll them into questions for the panelists. And then we'll probably open it up at the end. If you guys have any outstanding questions, you can ask them uh, directly of Brian, Nicole, Hiram and Luke. So um, let's get this party started. Um, I want to throw this one out to, um, I think Luke will start with you and, um, then I'd like all the other panelists to just kind of weigh in, we'll keep this fun and freewheeling. So, um, what advice would you give to a student or somebody earlier in their career who's looking to pursue a career like yours, Luke? Um, boy, that's a great question. So, you know, one of the things that I feel is like most important to these kind of spaces, especially spaces that are um, sp spaces that are changing, is to remember that humans are relatively the same. We've been the same for a long time, uh, thousands and thousands of years. Our tools are different, uh, and our communication styles might be different, but um, but the tools are, are really what's changing, not the people. So, um, you know, if if you center what you're thinking around, especially, you know, I work in AR and. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to, to work in, inside of those realms. Um, so especially, you know, if you feel like you're a, a student who's um, more on the creative side, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of ways to get into that kind of a field where you don't have to know um, all the ins and outs of, of what you think you might need to, to learn to break into there. Um, there's a lot of 2D application still in, in, in AR. Um, there's a lot of kind of old movie tricks like lace over the lace over the uh, the, the camera lens to, to give a depth effect type of thing. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ways to break into that, and that's on the creative side. But you know, there's a lot, a lot of other avenues there. And if you kind of think about, especially kind of these burgeoning areas um, like uh, more metaverse type stuff. Um, Roblox, and then you have Sony pushing a lot of stuff towards Unreal Engine, and I think you'll hear more and more. Of course, that word metaverse will end up becoming some of a cheesy word eventually, but um, that's a real thing. And uh, I think if you kind of understand where some of these things are going, you realize there's a lot of application out there, meaning that it's not just, you don't have to become a master of craft in, in, in a piece of software. Um, if you're a master of craft of experience, you can apply that to these realms as well, or a master craft of set design, or uh, something that Nicole does applies directly to this st stuff. It's very experiential and, and tactile, even though it's can be digital. Be, stay curious. That's my advice. Yeah, I you know my um, 
what I always tell students, and we're, we're, if we're talking about, you know, younger generation is internships, find internships, um, whether they're paid or not. Um, there's not as, you know, in terms of journalism, there's not as many because, uh, you know, the Miami Herald, uh, Sun Sentinel, even the Dallas Morning News, the Detroit Free Press, they barely have art departments anymore. Um, but you still have the big ones like the LA Times, uh, USA Today, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, they do. And there's some others out there that still do. Um, but I would say is to do internships, you know, you learn on the job without the pressure of, of dealing with a client, like, you know, one-to-one -one and failing. So, so you'll have other people around you, they'll mentor you and help you learn. Art directors will help you grow. Um, but then you also meet a lot of people. You, you get to, sometimes in these internships, you get to go to conferences and you meet other people in the industry and you develop contacts. And, you know, for me, I did various internships and there was one internship I didn't do, which was the Orange County Register because that internship came soon after the Iraq, the first Iraq war happened and they used all their internship money to send reporters to, to overseas. So they canceled that internship. But so I ended up going to uh, the Detroit uh, Free Press to do my internship there. But they were one of the first um, uh, newspapers to offer me a job when I, when I graduated, despite the fact that I never worked there um, because they kept an eye on me over, over time, the work that I did at the Herald. So internships is, is invaluable and you'll get to see whether you really want to do that as a career or not. When you do it day in and day out, and the challenges that come in day in, day out, and working late, um, and all those, you know, uh, reacting to news events, and all those sort of things. So internships would be the key as a student. I think I could, yeah, build off of that is, um, in my industry, I would say that um, my advice is always to be a little brave. Because um, I know that when I was starting out, um, I always felt like I had to take free jobs because I wasn't skilled enough and I always needed like, you know, whatever job I took that was going to pay me, it was going to be the one thing I didn't know how to do. So I needed to go to school to learn everything, um, which is just not going to happen ever. Um, so I always feel like you just need to go out there and try it, um, especially in my kind of work where we have really long hours. So doing that before you get four years into a degree and you realize like, oh, wait, the work actually is really hard <laughs> and um, I'm painting all day and I'm really dirty. <laughs> um, you have to like really know that you love it before you really get invested into it. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities to in stuff that you may not think would be um, a scenic painting. You know, I think the best example I always give is like haunted houses, which are just like all scenic painting because it's just dirty. You're just throwing stuff around. And it's a great, just like almost like an internship, but they'll pay you most of the time because they just don't, you know, most places have a haunted house that you could just throw dirt and blood on the floor and stuff. Um, but it is actually experience, you know, and that is actually one of my skill sets. So um, it's a great place to start. And yeah, I tell people to just keep your eyes open for anything that you think could possibly be painted and try to reach out. I've reached out to companies that I'm like, maybe all of your stuff is, you know, graphics, maybe it's something and they had positions open. So yeah, being open-minded and brave. Um, I'll second I that I'll being brave. Thing jump on it as well. Slide in. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I was just saying, I'll second that because I feel like uh, most people today, most young people today are, are pretty brave with just sliding into your, they'll just message you. They'll message brands, they'll message anybody. So you can message people. They're, they're used to it. Just go ahead and message people. I agree. I think um, folks today are growing up knowing that they need to put themselves out there more. It might have been a little tougher when we were all coming up. Uh, I, I just want to emphasize what Hiram was saying. Uh, that was going to be my, my arrow and my quiver is internships. Um, if you're in a design field and you're at a design school or even a, at a, uh, say a community college uh, design program, most of them will have design internship opportunities. By God, take them. Uh, even if, say, you want to be a car designer, but it's at a swimwear company. I mean, it can be something 180 degrees. Take it and network when you're there 
you know, make yourself known, not, not obnoxiously so, but you know, let folks know you're there by the quality of your work and by your work ethic. Um, get to know people because it'll, it'll, uh, it'll put you in good stead in the future. It really is a lot, and this probably goes for all your industries, a lot of who you know is just as much as what you know still, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of talent out there and you're gonna be competing against that. So it's really good to uh, have a broad base of people that you know and that have worked with you, know what you're like. Excellent. Um, also, this was else, one uh, that I am curious about, guys. Um, I want to know something about the way that each of you work that designers in other parts of the market wouldn't know or think about. What's something that's unique to what you do that other people might not consider? I think I'll throw that one to Nicole first because I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Sure. Um, you know, I think something about the way you know, I've talked about this before where, um, you know, everything is getting very technological. And I think that people underestimate how much I can, not just me specifically, but people in my position could do with paint and just canvas. Um, we can make a lot, we can make a lot of things, you know, especially if you're doing it on camera, you can make a lot of things disappear, look good, look three dimensional, and it doesn't need to be as expensive as, you know, some poorly photoshopped, you know, backdrop that you desperately need. Um, I could actually give you whatever you wanted and it would actually be very easy. Um, and really just like, I, I think one of my skills that I always think is unique to my job is um, color matching. I can color match anything that you want. I mean, if you want me to paint something over, if you want me to match a little tiny spot, I can, we, a scenic artist can do that. <laughs> you know, we've been our trained eyes. <laughs> and so I feel like that's something that you hone over 10 years, you know, 20 years. You can just, I know exactly the color formula I should mix to get that. Yeah. That's what I. <laughs> so, so you could do something like paint repair, like like a, like repair paintings. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Same. Once you start thinking of yeah, once I break down all of the different skills I you know use daily, I, there's a lot of stuff that opens up to a whole bunch of other industries that I'm like oh yeah yeah I can do that. <laughs> it's it's funny you talk about the the you know being able to use paint to pull off the, the dimensional stuff because I feel like that's very applicable to the to my world too because a, a lot of times uh, 3D just as you have to deal with cell phone connections and and slow connections and you can't put a huge 3D scene in there so a lot of times you do end up using 2D assets and using paint tricks to, to add depth, uh, and, and use those exact same tricks. I mean, it's like almost a one, cause I used to do set design too. when I was in like in high school and used to do design for plays and things. I use a lot of the same techniques. It's hilarious. So it's very, 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 very similar. Yeah. I would, you know, I, I'd say that for me, what people might find interesting is that on any given day, I'm probably working on four or five different projects for, from, uh, from different clients. And, um, you know, even though my, my niche is 3D illustration and infographics and data visualization, I do a lot of uh, brand design and I do a lot of just hand illustration, um, I, I graphic design, flyers, business cards, logos, um, you name it. And that probably comes from the fact that in my experience in journalism, we were doing three, four, five assignments a day. So one was a map, one was a chart, another one was an illustration. Maybe it was a long-term illustration. Um, then another chart came, then another map. And so I was used to jumping from one thing to the other. But I also like it because I don't get bored on one, any one given project. Um, if you're working on long-term projects, it could get a little tedious. And so it's nice that I can just stop, put that aside and work on something totally brand new that's totally different. Um, work on that for a while. When I get tired of that, jump onto the next project and finish them all by, you know, by Friday. So, um, so yeah, it's a little different as opposed to just getting one project and working on that the whole time. I'm, I'm multi, multi-projecting <laughs> um, every week. That is interesting. Um, you know, kind of good insight from all of you guys. 
uh, Nicole, there's people who are getting like uh, Instagram and TikTok famous just doing like impressive paint matching in real time. I mean, I feel like maybe this is a side hustle for you. <laughs> yes, I, I so I've seen a lot of those videos and I we I've shared them in like our Facebook groups, you know, for scenic artists and we're always just like, I don't understand what's what's the big deal. Like this is <laughs> this is Monday through Friday. And also there's a lot of them that I look and add and critique and I'm like, you probably should have added orange. Yeah, I mean, you know, just like <laughs> I wouldn't have done it then. Well, that's fine, you know. <laughs> you went the long way. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, Brian, uh, what is uh, something that your day-to-day -day life includes that designers from another part of the industry may find surprising? I think you're on mute. Nope. Okay, how about now? Good. Okay. Boy, trying to think of something that's surprising. Um, probably how fast and loose the toy business is compared to what we all joke about as being straight design, where, you know, people that are doing um, product design, you know, automotive design, that sort of things. Um, th things change very, very quickly. We have to be very adaptable. Things can be dropped or picked up. Everything's on a um, shoestring budget, not not uh, our compensation, but the uh, the budgets for the product development it tends to be tight. So we use certain tried and true shortcuts, shall we say, things that are things that are kind of known that you can get away with to make something look a lot more than it is, um, while still truly giving value. I mean, that's the big challenge. Like, oh, you've got twenty nine cents to work with, and it needs to look like it's going to be worth twenty bucks at retail. It's a slight exaggeration, but um, I don't know. I'm not sure if that really answers the question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's really good. It's faster and looser business, I think. It, there's still a lot of hand, uh, hand drawn uh, conceptual work, probably more so than in a lot of other industries because of uh, the sort of intricate, very hands on nature of toys, I think drives that. That makes perfect sense. I want to um, like uh, take a moment just to help contextualize our conversation. Do you guys want to just go around Rob and, and tell us about something that you've done recently or, you know, in, in the recent past that uh, is really cool or that you're proud of just like a recent project? I'm not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're probably on a code of silence. <laughs> I can. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I just had one launch about a month ago that I can talk about. Thank God. If, you, if this happened before that, then I wouldn't have been able to. But um, I, I work. Um, I do all of the AR effects uh, for um, for National Geographic and. <laughs> that allows us to have some pretty amazing access to their scientists and their writers. And um, all the stuff that we build is um, really uh, narrative driven. And we under try to, we try to build it for the audience though. It's on Instagram. Uh, Instagram audience is notoriously uh, on the selfie side of the things and not on the world side. We want to push them to the world side. So we try to tell stories on the world side. Uh, we will tell stories on the selfie side too. But uh, cause hey, we're still trying to, make our audience happy. So uh, we try to figure out how to use uh, these narratives to get people to learn things. And um, just recently we built one for uh, um, the uh, rover landing on Mars. And we worked with NASA from about August of last year uh, to try to determine timing, uh, what it was gonna do when it first landed, what the first day looked like, when we could get assets back, how we could get those 360s back um, and uh, it was awesome. We got to work with the people who ran the cameras, who ran the arm, who uh, I had access to teams of people who I have a, who their IQ is in, a, in it's crazy. I had to show some of them how to use Instagram, which is pretty funny. Um, but, you know, 
um, working with those teams is like a, a dream come true for me as somebody who's, I mean, we all kind of love the idea of exploration and that kind of thing, but um, to be able to work with them and, and, and have timing down and say, you know, in the first day we knew we were going to get a 360 panorama. It was going to do X, Y, and Z. Of course, we were we were at the end of a long chain of things, um, but uh, we wanted the panorama for this effect so we could get people to to bring people to Mars on the same day, so we could try to get them in the exact same spot that the rover was uh, the moment that it touched down, uh, and we we did it within about within about eight hours or so, uh, which is crazy if you think about that thing landed and then eight hours later you could get on Instagram and, and one, take a selfie with the rover on Mars or actually like get on Mars and drive around uh, at, at the exact spot that that thing is sitting. Um, and then we, and then we had to talk to them about how sound worked on Mars uh, because the nitrogen levels are so high. So everything kind of sounds like a muffled, you know, what a laser kind of sounds like a whip crack when you, it's a crack, 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 like electrical shock. Uh, but there it sounds more like a, like a like an old pan dunk dunk it's weird um anyway all kinds of stuff but we did it to make sure that it was accurate as accurate as we could possibly make out of an instagram filter so um that's something i'm really proud of just because it was a lot of a lot of damn work to get to go into it and and, and do something that most people probably look at and think oh, this probably took a couple of weeks it's like <laughs> you have no idea <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the most expensive thing ever made when it comes to Instagram filters, if you factor in what it took to make this thing. So pretty crazy. That's cool. I'm, uh, I've been working since, since late November on a series of um, animated videos for Arizona State University, um, having to do with next generation uh, education workforce and different ways to teach kids. And even one of those videos, it has to do with homelessness as well. Um, and so I've, I've learned a lot in terms of, and I've, I had done it way in the past, but not that often. And so I'm the one that's doing, um, we get the script, I come up with all the ideas um, that, that are going to be illustrated in the animation. And then I draw all the pieces and then I hand it off to uh, an animator because the timeline is so short, it's like five months. They actually wanted in three months at the beginning and I was like, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Um, five, five, almost eight, nine minute videos in, in three months is, is impossible. But, but what I found is how lucrative it is. Um, and it can be anywhere from 2000 to 3100 or 3200 per minute that you charge. So a nine minute video that you work on and takes you probably a month and a half that's twenty seven thousand dollars. <laughs> um, so it's it's uh, incredible, you know, lucrative uh, business, but also it was very, very fun, a different thing from what I'm used to. Um, and you and, and that's one the reason why I bring it up, because don't be afraid to try something that you're not used to, because it can pay off <laughs> in the long in the long run. Um, and I've hired some other uh, animators and some other designers to help me finish them all off. Um, so they'll be ready um, sometime uh, by the end of May. So sometime in June, I think their website will come up. It's called Next Education um, Next Education Workforce. There's an S in there somewhere. I can't remember now. I think it's the name of the, the university or something. But, um, but when I get that, I'll, I'll share it um, when they're all completed. But that's, yeah, that's really, you know, really cool thing I've been doing that never thought I would, I would get to do. That sounds rad. Brian, Nicole, anything that uh, is from the Wayback Machine that you could talk about without getting like... <laughs> you want me to go? Um, I really can't think of a specific. And, the, and the, the reason is that I'm usually working on anywhere from three, say three to five different projects at the same time. I'm usually working at the very beginning of the development curve when we're, we're doing the what ifs. Um, and, and what can it be sort of uh, angle on, on a various toy, various, uh, various properties and various toys. And so over the years, it, it works up into, you know, hundreds and hundreds of things of which, eh, you know, 10, 15% make it to production. And so often by the time it's made it to production, I've forgotten all about it. And I'll be reminded of it maybe a year later. Oh yeah, this thing came out. An example came up today of a and it's not one that you know is necessarily I'm proud of or anything, but I mean I, I guess I am. But you know, 
uh, Disney's Frozen. It's been a big thing for many years. Um, and I'm working on a, a new property with uh, the client, but she brought up a, a frozen place that we worked on probably five years ago. Um, and I finally saw it for the first time today. Like, oh, that was it. You know, and when it came out and it, it came out looking really good. Um, I, I've worked on, I mean, I've worked a lot with Disney, with Lucasfilm, with um, Pixar. You know, one of the nice things in the toy business is you're not, you're not, well, you're not developing the actual properties. You're, you know, you're working on applications of the properties. You know, how can we make them into toys? But you get this little window seat to see what's coming down the pike for the next year or two. And that's always exciting. Um, and I always have a little bit of envy for the designers that are, you know, working at those studios. But that's a whole different thing. You know, the VizDev uh, folks, different angle. But, um, yeah, I can't, I can't really talk about anything I've done in the last at least 18 months or so. We're just not allowed to. Yeah, so no worries. I think the birds of plate set was a perfect example. Yeah. You and Hiram made me think of how strange it is what we do. Uh, I totally relate to by the time any of my work sees the marketplace, I've already moved on. Like, I'm about 18 it. projects past yeah. that. Like, oh, great. Uh, it, it's alive. <laughs> when, the, when the Mandalorian stuff came out, it was like, oh, yeah, God, I worked on that back in, you know, 2016 or something. And it was just, <laughs> old hat, you know, and you, 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 you internalize it, you, you work on it, then you just wash it out of your brain for the next thing. And then, and then they come out. That's yeah. actually interesting because that is what I was going to mention. We did um, at New York Toy Fair not last year, the year before, since there wasn't, well, actually, I think there was, yeah, because it's in January, um, we did a Mandalorian, um, like the pram for Baby Yoda, because Mattel made a Baby Yoda, so I painted, uh, we built and painted that, they made one that actually floated, um, it but had it was like two, yes, it was a secret, but now it's out, yeah. and actually, they just sold one on eBay that I painted, um, oh. and, uh, my stuff is interesting because as soon as I'm done with it, I, yeah, don't see it again. Um, and oftentimes because it like goes in the trash because it's just like for an <laughs> event and it's like in a warehouse somewhere. And then really it's like, we didn't want to hurt your feelings, but we don't need this ever again. <laughs> um, so it's like, okay, cool. So I, I painted about five Baby Yoda prams. And I know that he has a name and I know that that is not correct, but um, we call him Baby Yoda and I like that name. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anybody to get angry. I know that he's <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, uh, the true fans are blowing up the chat now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I work in a toy company, so Baby Yoda is cute. So <laughs> Uh, let me ask you guys, um, based on your experience or people that you know you work with, uh, what do you think is the hardest part of breaking into your uh, your part of the industry? What's the what's the big barrier that people run into? And Nicole, I guess you can lead us off. Sure. I mean, you know, this last year has been really difficult because um, as a scenic artist, traditionally we work in theater and I know that most of my colleagues that I know that are scenic artists have been unemployed for a year. Um, and I do not know how much that will change. Uh, I know that theater will be one of the, you know, first to close, last to open type of things. And, you know, I work with about three scenic artists here. That's a very small number, like when we're not hiring, you know, like there's not a lot of opportunities. So I think that is always one of the barriers is, just really finding those opportunities. You know, you have a bunch of people that graduate. I mean, not a bunch of people, you know, they're a scenic artist is very niche within like a technical theater degree. You have like maybe a couple of graduates from a specific program. There's only like five or six programs in the country that actually are for scenic painting. Um, but that's still just, you know, those, that work, there's not a lot out there. Um, and finding it is difficult. It's not easy to get into a union, um, especially on the West Coast. California is, diff Los Angeles is very difficult. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's finding your way. I, I know that I um, took whatever job I could that had a paintbrush in it. And that was just the way that I 
you know, I there I spent a little bit of time painting handbags, like painting, you know, monograms onto handbags just because someone was hiring. And that just got me through a theater gig that, you know, I had no idea. So I got lucky. I feel like I'm lucky every day that I have a full time job year round at Mattel. Um, and that is why I've been here so long. I, most of my colleagues do not have that pleasure. So don't take it for granted. <laughs> Yeah, I would, you know, I would say that if, if you wanted to get into, you know, illustrated graphics, um, explanatory graphics, or uh, data visualization, when I started, there was a lot of um, newspapers that had art departments, and you can find jobs all over the place. Um, that's not the case now. So for the most part, you might want to, you would have to look at magazines like National Geographic and Science and and others like that um, to look for those opportunities. Um, and then when it comes to universities, there's not a lot of universities that within their journalism or, or, or design programs offer infographics or offer uh, explanatory illustrations. Um, there's a few, you know, uh, University of Athens in Ohio, uh, Northwestern, um, um, University of Miami, um, there might, uh, I mean, even Savannah College of Art and Design that I, I got my MFA from them, they don't have a pure infographics um, class, or at least they didn't as of last year. Um, so there's a lot of limited lim limitations in terms of getting that kind of education. Um, so you got to pick certain schools in, if you want to do that in terms of an education. And then again, you know, then looking for a job is, is, is that, you know, the magazines are probably the better way to go. Unless you you can crack into the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, those, um, those newspapers. So I think that's the toughest challenge now is finding those opportunities. I think uh, in my little world, my toughest challenge is probably in just a misunderstanding of what, what it really is and, and where, what it is. Um, and it's trying to get, um, you know, so augmented reality is what I work in, but that really consists of a lot of different things. So um, augmented reality uses computer vision to try to detect things in a room. So there's a whole level of um, people who study just that. Uh, there's machine learning that tells, uh, learns what's in the room and then continues to learn. Um, and then um, you're doing stuff from big data and pulling contextual data and trying to figure out, um, is this person happy or sad? There's five people in the room. Are they talking? How far away are they? Uh, there's so much contextual data there that has nothing to do with design, zero to do with it. And I like design and I love design. Uh, but there's so, I mean, I, I say design, but there's like sound design and oh, there's just so many levels of design that people I think just don't really think are applicable. So they, they kind of stop and they think it's, it's putting 3D models in a, in, a, in a space. That's what they think of AR. They think it's putting a thing in, a, in, in a, 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 a digital thing in a physical space. And what it really is, is uh, a revolution of the interfaces itself. Uh, so you start seeing it on cars. Um, most cars are going to have some level of AR on the dashboard to some degree within the next five years. Um, and you're going to see that in more and more places. And it's not going to be these obvious things where you're holding your phone up and it feels like this awkward thing. Um, it's very much in its infancy, but it's trying to get people to understand that, you know, we're, we're kind of tinkering around with uh, the internet when everyone thought it was a phone book. You know, the people thought that thing was a phone book back in the early 90s. They thought it was a, a digital phone book. And it's not. It's a huge tool that you just don't. It was, it's a world changing thing. And um, so I say that a lot because I, I try to get people to, uh, part of my job is to educate people what the space is and get them excited about working in it. So, so forgive my passion about it, but, um, but it really is a misunderstanding of it. And I think people think it's, uh, you have to be a video gamer or a 3D gamer or a 3D modeler. That's part of it. That's definitely part of it. You don't have to do that, but that's, that's, that's one avenue you can do. Uh, it's kind of like saying, I build websites, so I have to know how to write JavaScript. Not if you're uh, an information architecture, uh, you don't. And not if you're doing um, um, 
not if you work with Webflow or something. You know, there, there's a there's a there's a ton of avenues underneath this underneath that website rock when you open it up. There are a lot of things scatter out. Uh, it's not just a, a programmer or a developer. And uh, one of the interesting things about AR, uh, especially the one that I work in, I work with some software called Spark AR. Um, I was one of the first 20 or so creators on there. There's about 400,000 people on there who are creators now. 75% uh, of them are women. Uh, I've been in the development space for a long time. I've never seen that in, in any programming capacity ever. And I think it's a, it, it, it just shows that it's a different thing. It, it, it's quite a bit different thing because it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge bucket. It's kind of like saying, like, I do things on the internet. And it's like, well, what the heck does that mean? You know, the internet's a big place. And I think right now it's a, it's a little keyhole of what they think it might be. But I think once you kind of get beyond that and people, it becomes more ubiquitous with life, people are going to start getting really used to seeing things on their displays, on their, on their, on their windscreens and things like that. Um, that's going to be very normal. And it might seem a little chaotic to people who aren't used to it. Um, but the people who grow up with it, it's going to seem like completely normal stuff. Same way that old people now kind of feel like the world's a chaotic place to the, the younger people. So it's kind of fascinating. So I, I think that's my big thing is really getting beyond that point and saying, you don't have to be a, a programmer. You don't have to be a 3D modeler. Um, there's a lot of avenue in this space because it's a lot bigger than you think it might be. It, it, it's, it's beyond that little device you have in your hand. It's, it's bigger than that phone screen. Long, long, it's a long answer, sorry. So um, next question I'm gonna throw out to you guys is um, give, we kind of talked about your origin stories and a little bit about um, how you got to where you were, but I would be interested to know kind of what, where were you at in your life? Give us a little bit of context. Where were you at in your life when you, when you kind of found your way into what you're doing now? Uh, Luke, if you want to lead us off on that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I came from an artist background again. I, I, I started uh, doing development from a different kind of path than I think a lot of developers do. I really started from the visual side of things and worked, worked backwards, um, which honestly helped, was quite helpful when I got into marketing because I, I was like, hey, I'm kind of a rare person in, in, in this development space to be able to do this. So um, I think what, what connected with me was Again, I, when I was working in New York for Sapient, and we were doing some things with experience modeling, and it was, uh, we would basically take people off the street. We were trying to figure out what's the best placement for a logo on a website, if you can believe that was, that's a question that we were asking. Uh, most people know where that goes now. Um, but we were trying to figure out what works best. And we were bringing in thousands of people and, and, and watching their eyes, doing heat maps on their eyes and stuff. and. Uh, which sounds antiquated a little bit now, but in 1998 or nine, it was pretty, we were, we were living on the edge. And um, what we discovered was when we had uh, people who were Hasidic Jewish, uh, they read the opposite way. And it was like, whoa, people are looking at this the way that they read. <laughs> I mean, no duh. So where's the logo go? Right at the top corner, almost all the time, because that's where everybody starts. And it's a psychological human trait, the same way we have... Uh, uh, the same way you don't put a shifter in a car in the center console, you have to have, you're shifting with that hand. You, it's on the other side. Every car you get into, even on the other side of the world when the car's flipped over, shifter's on the other side, shifter's on, you know, the, the turn signal's on this side, the shifter's on the other side. Uh, it's because we're human beings. And it's, it, it's not because, uh, it's kind of like the same thing as color theory. It falls in that same thing. There's a, there's, there's a reason why you don't paint doctor's offices red. There's a reason why you don't put a logo at the bottom of the page. There's a reason why you don't make your navigation confused. You know, a lot of those things are, are things that we had to figure out early, early on. And um, I remember having that light bulb go off in my head, like, oh man, there's this whole idea of systems behind these things and how people use things. And, and it's, I can design it however I want. I can be wild style, <clears throat> but if nobody uses it, I'm not doing a good job as a, as, as a, in, in my space anyway. Um, so yeah, so that was what really set me off was like, and that was about 20 years ago, but 20 years ago, I was like, this is what I really love about this. And 
I was still a programmer for about another 15 years or so, but that was like what I really cared about was like, how do I make this stuff as, 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 uh, as readily, you know, tangible to people to where, again, it feels like pages in a book. Like you just, you're not reading a book, you're involved in a story and you're not holding that book, but you really are. Like, how do you get beyond that point to where you're, you don't care about it anymore? Yeah, you know, I would say for me, I mean, it was organic in terms of going, you know, working at the Herald when as a as an intern while I was going to school and and kind of knowing that that's what I wanted to do that I wanted to do uh, infographics and illustrated infographics and back then there was no there weren't three D programs so you had to make everything look three D with Photoshop you know fake three D make it look know a little bit about perspective draw draw the shapes and then put textures in them and make it look as realistic as you could. Um, but, you know, and I was at the Herald uh, for, for when those last six years I was a graphic editor, I tried to get them to put money into training um, the staff and into buying 3D software and they wouldn't do it. So I finally quit and went to work for the Sun Sentinel because they, they did it and they had a lot of space in their pages to do it. And, and so there I learned to use Lightwave um, and, use, and, and learn 3D. And then National Geographic called, um, but when I by the time by the time I got laid off from National Geographic, at that point, I had I had I was doing a lot of freelance already, but I was afraid to make the jump. And a lot of the sources that I used for graphics, that I either art directed or that I actually illustrated in the magazine, were asking me to do freelance work for them because they liked what I had done. So that was, you know, soon, as uh, soon after I got laid off, I, I decided that I'm just going to do this as a freelancer. I'm not going to work for anybody uh, to go in nine to five. I'm going to work from home. And, uh, and all those sources, you know, ended up being my clients. So uh, Everglades Foundation, I do a lot of work for them. A lot of Habitat 3D modeling illustrations. Um, and then you know, there was a nuclear reactor company called New Scale Power. They'll probably in about three or four years you'll you'll be hearing from the, about them because um, they're going through all the regulate you know trademark regulations and all that stuff. Um, and I ended up doing a lot of 3D and animation and cross sections of nuclear reactors and opening them. I never knew that I would be signing non disclosure agreements that I can never tell any share those plans with anybody. <laughs> So I've, I've gotten those plans and then after I'm done with the project, I delete them from my computer so no one can get in and, and grab them. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, that's how I kind of, you know, fell into that. It, it was kind of organic, but the freelancing side was, was a gentle push by National Geographic. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me that I got laid off because I always wanted to work from home. I, I wanted to be a comic book artist when I was like a little kid um and wanted to just be drawing from home so it kind of worked out now i'm working from home well i'll go next um so actually uh where i was in my life was about high school so i grew up in culver city which is in los angeles but it is home to sony studios which used to be mgm studios um, and so just growing up in that town, we always knew someone that worked there. So I spent, you know, I went on a couple of the studio tours just with like family from out of town. And I went a few times and I remember like the first time we were walking by and like a stage door was open and they had a huge backdrop just up. And that was like the first time I had seen it like that. You know, you just see it on a screen and, you know, you believe it like, oh, they're in the jungle, but just seeing behind the curtain um and the you know the studio tour person said like oh this this is the job of a scenic artist like this is they, they paint this and I my mind exploded and I was just like what are you talking about like that is there's no way there's 50 feet of you know fabric in here um so that was really I mean that was that was the first time I had ever heard that that was a thing that people did and then later I looked up the job and when I looked up scenic artist, it only talked about theater just because that is like the historical. And I was just like, well, I want to do it for film. Like, and, I, and for some reason in my head, it was like, that's a completely different thing. <laughs> um, I was wrong, of course, but I was just like, well, I'm not going to go to school for theater because that's not what I want to do. I want to do film. Um, <laughs> so I ended up 
kind of making my own four-year degree um, at a couple of different school uh, schools. I went to school for set design, fine arts, painting, and then finally I found a program in New York for scenic painting that wasn't, it was just a certificate program. Um, they, for some reason, let me in with zero experience, but I went and I'm grateful. And um, yeah, after that, I was like, oh yeah, that was, it's amazing. And you know, now I watch movies all the time and I'm like, well, duh, that's a backdrop, like <laughs> obviously. But um, when I was in high school, it blew my mind that that was a thing. <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. I guess I'm it now, huh? I'm left over. Uh, yeah, I think with me, it was a matter of serendipity, and dumb luck and location. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, Silicon Valley at a time when you know Apple computer and all that was really coming up and I think the emphasis in high school was oh, you are going to be a software developer you're going to be in computers not me personally but that was the big hot thing and everyone was very excited about it I had zero interest in that whatsoever I was the kid that drew little aliens and went and saw wizards four times in a row and you know drew cartoons and ticked off the art instructor and um, after graduating and I kicked around uh, junior college for a couple of years doing journalism and, and general ed and, and sticking with the art. And then I moved down to Los Angeles to uh, go to the UC, uh, UCLA. Again, lucky enough to go to it for a couple of years, but um, in the design program and um, found there that it was more of a theoretical design program. And I was learning more and more about what the field really entailed didn't entail writing papers about it. It's, it's more of a hands-on experience. And the instructors there would, uh, would sort of do this, well, if you want to go to a trade school, and I'm thinking, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> turned out a friend of mine that I'd grown up with in high school that I had a lot of admiration for. He was in the graphic design program at a little school in Pasadena called Art Center. And um, he took me on a little tour there. And uh, it took me about a week to pick my jaw off the ground and, and uh, because I could see what the possibilities were. Nicole's nodding her head, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> um, and of course, I didn't have any money for it or anything, but uh, after a while, I scraped things together and was lucky enough to go to Art Center and, and matriculate there. I went as an automotive design major. And the reason I chose that over a few of the other offerings at the time is it seemed like the one that my parents would support the most. Um, you know, it had a, that was the thing the school is known for, at least at the time. It's still very famous for that. And, you know, it's, it's a serious career and it's real. Uh, but when, I'm, when I was there, uh, a lot of the instructors are in the toy industry. Um, so you got a lot of, we got a lot of exposure to that. And I found that was a better fit. And again, this goes back to what we were all talking about earlier in terms of networking and internships. And I was allowed to uh, sort of follow that into, um, you know, it worked out into a career as a toy designer rather than an automotive designer. Um, so I know a lot of famous car designers, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I've been happier as a toy person. Um, That's really fun. And um, Brian, you just made me think of another question I'm going to throw to you and have everyone weigh in on. Um, <clears throat> artistic inspirations or aspirations when you were young people. Uh, tell me about, you know, Hiram mentioned he wanted to be a comic book artist. Tell me about like kind of those those uh, early artistic inspirations and the things that kind of uh, shaped your initial pursuit of, of um, what you do now. Just keep going. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Well, I grew up, you know, again, Bay Area. So, you know, we love the underground comics of the time, you know, Dan O'Neill and the uh, fabulous furry freak brothers and that sort of stuff you know the, the head shop comics <laughs> that you could see in the in the 70s uh, were a big influence Ralph Bakshi's animated films were were a lot of fun um uh gosh what else uh you know you're again California you're into the cars uh, there's a car culture and, and you're influenced by the the low riders and the hot rods and, and all that as a guy growing up anyway um you know, you're in, we were into that. Um, and, and it begins to dawn in you that someone's getting paid to do all this stuff and um, might as well be you. It takes a long time to actually get the confidence to say, yeah, I guess I can do that. But you start meeting people that actually do it and you begin to believe that, wow, maybe I can do this too.
And then LA is that, you know, on steroids. I guess I can add. LA, LA is a whole other thing. <laughs> Ken Nicole can speak to that. Uh, great place to, for an artist or designer to, uh, to come up in. There is so much opportunity in so many places. Yes, that is true. Um, so I would say when I was a kid, um, I'm an only child and I used to always think well. that art <laughs> art um, was like a sibling to me. I used to just do anything. I mean, I made furniture when I was in high school. I mean, bad, you know, it was bad stuff. It was not great, but um, I used to do it just because I was bored. Um, I painted all of my walls. Uh, my parents hated that. Um, <laughs> um, I used to make jewelry. I knitted. I mean, I just like, just anything that I could do to just get away from boredom I would do it and so it took me a really long time to actually not think of art as just a hobby because I was just doing it because I was bored and I was like I was like I don't you know that would take out the fun of it I just wanted to half finish you know this table I didn't want to really like be beholden to like make it look good um so it actually took me a really long time to like you know okay actually I think this would be great every day and, you know, hardly working, working hard, you know, that whole thing. And um, yeah, I just, once I, actually, I think the thing that got me in was my first office job. I worked in an office for about eight months and I was just like, wow, I hate this so much. Um, so I was like, okay, so maybe that hobby thing actually could be a career and how do I do that? So yeah, that was, it was, the only time I've ever worked in an office and it scarred me for life, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I used to, I always used to draw as a little kid and, but I was always, you know, from about the age of five, stuff that I would draw would be, you know, a shoe and I would draw a shoe or a car and I would try and draw a car. And then when I was eight years old, Star Wars came out. And when I sat in that theater and I saw that spaceship go over my head and I was blown away and all of a sudden my drawings were about space wars and all this creativity and creatures and monsters and people, you know, soldiers fighting and people's heads being chopped off. I was, I was a kid with my wife that if they, if teachers would have seen the drawings I was doing when I was in seventh grade, they would have put me <laughs> They would have put me away. They would have thought I was going to be a serial killer or something. <laughs> Back of math class, yeah. <laughs> and um, and that 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 movie opened up my creativity um, to just in, you know imagine things and put them to paper. And you know what the the one thing that my dad would do almost every week was buy me a ream of white paper and I, and markers and and I had markers and pencils and I would just draw two three hours a day every day as a little kid um and and I, I don't know if it was OCD or what but but that all that drawing made me you know all that drawing made me the artist I am today and and I I always go back to that that movie that that kind of created that creative explosion in my head my, mine was um I had a, uh, I was, again, I was an artist before I was uh, doing anything in the, in the technological space. So I, um, I started off doing, um, my mom was a painter. So I started doing acrylics and oils and, um, and really love, love doing like still life and crepa. And I, I was really art nerd, hardcore art nerd when I was younger. And, um, <laughs> But I really like creating. I think that's what it was, was I just really enjoy creating, period. And I was able to kind of channel that into other ways, other things with, with digital work too and, and get the same, uh, or at least somewhat similar um, kind of dopamine rush or, or, or whatever that might be, satisfaction um, from, from creating. But, uh, you know, having, um, having a creative uh, parent in my life was, I think, pretty, pretty key. And uh, always told, you know, always keeping in mind, like, it's better to create than to destroy. So like, don't tear things down. If you want to, if you want to add things to the world, don't take them out. And, um, you know, that's how you want to try to approach everything and always try to create. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I think early on, I was just really, really, really drawn to art. 
and 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 that storytelling. And then, uh, of course, I was a comic book nerd, and I and I loved. I also loved Wizards, and I also loved all those old, just older. Uh, and then I got into you know I I was born in 1978, so around 1986, 88, I started getting into some a little light anime stuff, and I really liked street art, and I really fell in love with ephemeral art. Um, I think that really struck a nerve with me that people would spend all this time on the street and paint this stuff and then leave it and let people destroy it or get it painted over. It could be painted over the next day. Who knows? Um, I really liked that concept because it was like a thing with like impermanence and, and uh, it's like some other things. But uh, I don't know. I just really like that, that idea. I think that's what really sent me down this path. And here I am making impermanent art. So what do you know? <laughs> that's a great one I, I um, and several of you guys mentioned comics and movies I, I also teach at University of Miami with Hiram and I teach an advertising copywriting and concepts class and I asked my students this semester do any of you guys read comics uh, anyone like comics and it was crickets because comics are like if you can understand a frame of a comic, you can understand the fundamentals of what advertising is. If like, you can make a good comic in the frame. movies. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, no, <Be> like, no. <laughs> yeah, you, once upon a time, they were on paper. People bought them. <laughs> yeah, nothing. So I'm not sure where, where students are drawing their creative inspiration today, but I guess it's not comics anymore. <laughs> yeah, oh, over to Social now. media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, J Dave, you probably find out that, I mean, probably most of your students are female, right? Uh, probably, yeah, it's like a 60-40 split. Okay. Yeah. That's probably why. Mm -hmm. you know, generally speaking, female friendly. They pick up comic books as much uh, yeah. in the day. I think they do more now. Yeah, I was thinking like, there's a lot of female manga fans and anime fans and stuff like that. So yeah. One thing I think is really interesting, too, is like, if you if you look at the most popular social media tools uh they're very much content creation tools and that's what those i think a lot of that is falling into that where, where people might have been illustrating or, or sitting with a pen and paper they're um they're editing tiktok videos and doing things like that on that tiktok are, and instagram right yeah. and comics and, i mean and, they have a, a fully fledged oh. video editing tool in their pocket that you know you could only dream of having in in the year 2000 uh, so it's it's pretty wild the kind of stuff that they make. I'm I'm really really impressed and try not to be too fuddy duddy about it all and just try to look at it like, you know, a different form of artwork. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> the comics of the '80s and '90s or earlier is now the gifts and memes of yeah. the 2020s. You know, totally. The yeah, my uh, one of my employees she was talking about how they used Instagram just to edit photography, right? Like, so it was like, they were like, they thought of themselves as like photographers and they like, were like, oh, we can easily access these filters and make our photos look more attractive. Like they didn't think about it as like a community or connecting with other people or anything like that. It was like, oh, here's this super easy, easy to access way to basically make my create, like cre creative look better, be better. It's like, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it's like it's a different. democratization of, of creation. And, and you think about the, um, think about Ansel Adams and how much time he spent in a dark room to get those things looking perfect. And now I can sit in Lightroom. I, anyone can sit in Lightroom and play with presets and perfect things that he could never dream of. I mean, and so, I mean, you, you kind of take these little skill sets that people have developed and you reduce them down to some knobs and stuff sometimes and it's it, it can be a little depressing but it does democratize creation so i think that's an interesting way to also kind of look at the flip side of that is that you have a lot more people out there who care about creating things which is which is good oh yeah i have a whole uh, discussion i have to have when we talk about borrowed interest that you know having uh kendrick lamar in your ad isn't an idea and ripping off someone's meme isn't an idea you know like that's not a concept that's borrowed interest you know <laughs> but i do think like young people are inherently creative right like they have a imagination they're just that's like the way that their brains are forming but you know, like i'm also a child of the 70s and the 80s and like you know when i was in school it was basically like yeah you could either be like a painter or like you could write poetry 
or like do photography. That was like the big thing that, right? Like, especially in the early nineties, like all the girls did photography <laughs> and I wasn't good at any of it. And it was frustrating because I like, needed a creative outlet and I had no, I had no tool to like enable me. So basically I just like sucked at being creative. And that's yeah. like not, <laughs> that's not good for fostering the uh, confidence when you're like a young person who has ideas, but can't necessarily put them down on paper, whatever metaphor you want to use for that, which is kind of to Luke's point, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I honestly think it's the same thing that happened with music in the 80s and with mixtapes and hip hop. And it's a very similar yeah. thing. Yeah. It's just it, a remix of a remix is great. It, it's, it's just a new form of, uh, of everything. We're all, you know, we're not mixing our paints like Michelangelo was. We're buying them from Liquitex. You know, give give me a break. We're all doing the same thing that the kids today are doing. It's just they're doing it with a digital tool. The tools yeah. are more powerful now. You can hear. For yeah, sure. When we were, well, especially me, but all of you, when you were all kids, we couldn't reach an audience greater than our circle of friends, perhaps our school, if we were on the paper or in the drama club or something. But nowadays, they can hit a worldwide audience with the yeah, tools, you know, it's, it's sort of standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, like the, the uh, was it Dr. Gershner? I can't think of his name properly. The founder of Adobe who passed away the other day, mm -hmm. they were talking about he, how he democratized printing, how, where, you know, I don't know when he started doing this. I think it was in the early seventies, but prior to about the eighties, if you wanted to publish anything, you had to go to a printer or a print shop or an actual publisher. And what uh, they were able to do was democratize the printing press. You, you develop the coding that allows you to send something from your computer to a printer. And that had never been done before. And it just blew, you know, it just blew everyone's brains wide open. Suddenly you could, you know, you can have your own paper, your own zine, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And this is what um, Luke's talking about, you know, with Instagram and whatnot. That's what's happening now. And in the future, I'm betting that DAR will, will head on to uh, our little handheld devices. We'll have phones like they have on the Expanse, you know, that you know, involve your entire psyche um, yeah. and pull I, in everybody else around you. I'm hoping that everybody Looking treats it as seriously, though, because like I'm trying to keep it to where, you know, again, that we're not trying to don't hold it, it back. <laughs> I, I just don't want people to abuse it and make it awful because the, the beginning of the Internet was pretty chunky. It was a pretty hard experience. And we had there was a lot of malicious clicking banner ad stuff that was there was just a lot of. It took a lot of trust. The internet's gotten so nice now. It's so friendly. It, it is much better. No, the, the internet yeah. was awesome when you were like 10 years old. And yeah. you like go yeah. on chat rooms, chat and rooms. strangers. Yeah. Like, this I mean, I didn't like, yeah, I'm sure my dad like hated it when he got like the porno <laughs> spam to him. But like, I had the best time, you know? I was thinking the other you day. You don't know about... the difference. You're just like, this is new and it's different and fun. Right. How, <laughs> how crazy is it that there was a network where they had a where everybody signed online and the very first thing they saw were rooms called teen chat, just tons of teen chat. Oh, rooms. I love I hung chat. Out teen chat. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, me too. And now I'm like, Oh my gosh, in 2020 or 2021. Now that's like, how would you ever, you might as well just set your company on fire. If you do something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's birth the building down. Truly. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a different world. It was, it, you know, it's fun. I do kind of miss a little bit of the wild Westy stuff about, you know, the early internet. And I'm sure you get a chance to relive some of that kind of in the messy part of AR's kind of, uh, ascendance now, Luke, it probably gives you echoes of that. Cause there's lots of yeah. really good and there's lots of really not good. <laughs> really not good. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a, there's a lot of kind of, uh, copies of ideas or, or, uh, um, the tools right now, you, you can build whatever you want. So the tools right now, you can build experiences that are really detailed um, if you want to. Are people's attention spans ready for that right now? Probably not. Um, it, they will be eventually. People will get more used to it and it'll be more ubiquitous and it won't, it won't feel like such a grand experience where you have to stop your whole life and pay attention to this thing. Um, it, it will be, it, it, it will get there, but... Um, <laughs> But you have to talk people off a, off a cliff sometimes, not off a cliff. You have to do, talk you, people. Uh, do you see a point where um, the tools for creating what you're doing now will be more democratized or won't involve? Totally. So that's one college, of Say a college degree and a, you know, a, a special workstation and certain software. Where it yeah. for nerdiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Totally. Um, 100%. 
uh, I, right now the software that I work with is uh, is a pretty heavily democratized piece of AR software. Um, it's one of the biggest right now that's that's out there, and, and it's because it's powered by social media as well. It's, mm -hmm. It has a, quite cool. a bit of a backbone on it. But um, you know, somebody kind of I, I remember going out in two thousand nineteen to uh, to a, a conference in in uh, San Jose, and somebody was like. Uh, you know, how crazy is it that, you know, Van Gogh had like, you know, 500 people look at his artwork before he died and you're having like, you know, a million and a half people look at your stuff every single day. Like, what does that feel like? And I was like, I never really put it in that kind of perspective, but <laughs> not to say that's even a comparison of artwork, but it's like the exposure is so insane. I mean, I have, I have a couple filters that are um, in the, in the tens of billions of, of eyeballs that have seen them. I mean, it's, more people have seen it than people are on the earth. More, more people Monetiz have looked at it. Monetization potential is just, yeah. wow. It's, it's yeah, it's, it, it, and that's what scares me about it is people are going to make it bad coming out of the yeah, gates, yeah. you know, because <laughs> it's like, what money, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's a, my kind of rules for the expansion of society. Anytime we have some new technological revolution, people ask three questions. Can I eat it, have sex with it, or make money off of it? And that's kind of how we encounter every new thing in our society. <laughs> totally. I can, like, I, I like the idea of NFTs, the concept of NFTs where people can, like, I like participating in things like First Fridays, that where, where we have local art. We have First Fridays in Kansas City where other, everybody gets together and we sell, sell art and art galleries. My art's digital. And, and it's like, well, you can put it on a TV. And it's like, but what the hell am I selling? The TV, the computer that's hooked up to it, the file? I mean... Whereas somebody can make a file in Photoshop or Illustrator and just print it out and sell a print. And it's like, but yours is still digital, just like mine. Yours is zeros and ones, just like mine. But you get to print yours out on a physical piece of paper. How do I sell mine in that same way? So I like the concept of NFTs, but oh my gosh, talking about NFTs to people who like NFTs is like talking to people who like crack cocaine or something. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's like, I can't deal with this. There's too much crazy hype behind this right now for it for me to want to care about it but i like the concept <laughs> i want to um hit on something that a couple of you guys have mentioned the importance in your life of like uh, paper and pencil or pen um do you, do all of you still do a lot of your work and preliminary thinking with with pen and paper there you go um, yeah, I mean, uh, to, to a certain extent, um, most of the time it's, if it's something really complex and it has a, a lot of different parts and I have to figure out what's the best way to accomplish that. Um, but I've been doing this for so long in terms of, of illustrating explanatory graphics and, and infographics and data visualization that I can pretty much in my head figure out what's what's going to be the best solution. Um, when you do 3D work, you always have then the, the option that you can just rotate it. Once you build it, you can rotate it. So if you, if you build it and you build it right, then if, it, if the angle that you thought was gonna work doesn't work, not, no problem, just rotate a little bit more or, or go up a little bit higher on it or come down a little bit on it. Um, so not as much, but, but I do tell my students um, that are starting out and, and for a long time, probably the first 10 or 15 years of my career, um, I, was, I was still drawing and sketching out concepts because I wasn't really sure what would be best. But I always tell my students to, once you have the content that your graphic is gonna be about, sketch it out and see what's gonna work best because they don't have the, they don't have the skills on the computers yet to really do stuff fast. So if they go to the computer and start drawing and then it doesn't look right, they gotta start all over again. Um, but you know, I, I've been doing this for such a long time. I draw really fast so I can try and draw something, put it together quickly. And if it doesn't work out, it's not a big deal. It only took me like 15 minutes. Um, but, but I, but yeah, so I tell my students to, to sketch out and when it's something really complex, I will. And there are certain clients that want to see a sketch first. Um, and when I worked at National Geographic, you had to have sketches, uh, four or five rounds of sketches. And then once that was, was okay, then you would go to the next phase. Um, but, 
but for, for freelance, not as much. I would say I that what I do is I am in the four or five rounds of sketches business. So um, I do sketch everything. Uh, although I'm, I, uh, I don't think I've done it by hand for probably 15 years. Uh, I do it on a tablet or on a Cintiq. Use a stylus. I have it, it's there. I can then take it to the next level, you know, render it, do it, do whatever I want with it. And, it, and it's recorded. But um, yeah, it's, it is good to have that hand to brain um, conduit or interface going. You need to, as a designer, or as a creative, you, this is how the ideas come. And um, the more you do it, um, the better you get at it. Just practice, That's a requirement practice. for me. I have to. Absolutely. Even if I'm just writing down an idea, it's like start off down here, go to here, pan over to this, you know, I'll just yeah. kind of like, I have to write it down. You don't even know what will come out. Even if you, and writing the same, it's the same with writing. You don't really know what's going to come out until you sit down and do it. I was That's actually going to say, um, when I, when I was in school, um, drawing was like a huge deal, of course. Um, when you're painting like backdrops, drawing is everything, you know, learning how to draw perspective and all of this stuff. I actually think it, with my work at Mattel, I actually don't draw that much. Um, only because a lot of the work I do is um, like faux finishes and treatments, you know, so it would be, I would have to like draw out a wood grain, um, which I actually used to do in school. We would draw out like wood grains just to like look at, you know, just to get a visual vocabulary of like, this is what quarter sawn oak looks like, you know. Um, but nowadays I just um, can, I, it's a lot of it is just by feel. I mean, you know, if I'm painting a big four by eight piece of like marble you know it happens in layers I look at what needs to be added and yeah there's not really I, I make lists definitely for like what I think the process would should or would look like um colors that I need to mix but when it's um comes to doing it it's usually just go <laughs> man I feel like that might be like the last like it's kind of shocking to hear that for some reason, <laughs> like maybe because I'm in design, but like just to kind of freehand it. And it's like the final, it's like what you get, you know, you're not like concepting and then like refining and then turning it around and like revising and all that stuff. Do you have like a piece of real marble or a piece of real wood next to you or a real tree or whatever it is? Or at this point, are you just like, man, I've done like monstera leaves so many times that I can just do it from like my head um it so it depends on like the client um we have specific some people come and say like I want this exact thing like a photo of exactly that um others will be very vague and just say I want it to look like wood and it'll be like do you, what wood you know like do you know what kinds of wood, how many wood there Oak. you know or metal <laughs> like I just want it to look like metal I'm just like what is that you know what does that mean um so you know we develop like a shorthand with certain people and some people just want exactly that um either way even if it's a specific piece I I, I work the same way in in layers I mean you know when I was in school when you're starting out a lot of people are very nervous you know like you have this thing like I want you to paint this to look like wood and you know people would spend like hours mixing paint but really you're just like trying to get the nerve to like put it down um and my teacher would always just like it's just paint you know like I can just go and start a project because if they don't like it I could just paint over it you know what I mean like it's not final like none of it is final and even when I put a clear coat on it and it is final like I, I could sand it all down tomorrow, you know, like none of it is really, you know, the thing. And if it gets messed up, I can fix it, you know, like, so yeah, I just, I usually just roll with it. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so are there any questions from anyone in the audience that I, you want to ask with our last few minutes? I have a question, Jacob. <clears throat> Go for it. Hi. It's I, <laughs> I'm loving this, um, geeking out with you guys. <laughs> I'm a designer as well. Um, but I think this might be, it's for everyone, but might be, um, Luke might have um, a better idea what I'm talking about. It's about user experience, how you say, you know, human behavior, 
it doesn't change. Um, and um, not the user experience that, you know, if you say user experience today, somebody immediately thinks of an app and it, it's not it, it's everything. It's point of sale, it's everything. Um, once you, you know what you see, you can't unsee it, you know, it's everywhere. So, and I feel like today's, um, the behavior, they, you mentioned that it doesn't change, but I think over time, over long periods of times, uh, maybe the attention span has gone like uh, narrower since, uh, you know, measuring from like 30 years ago to today. Um, I don't know, just your thoughts on on, on, on that, because it, today it's like everything is ADD. It's like too much, I like get five screens going. And if it doesn't catch my attention, like, but before people don't read. Before it was like, you know, I'm going to, you know, there's a sign. I'm going to read that sign. Nobody reads anymore. So, I mean, it's just like that behavioral change change throughout time because I know you said you started in the 90s and now and then if you have any like comparison to that, that yeah. that's that's my yeah, question yeah. it's very open no, and no. it's very open question it's just I think that the I, I mean I definitely think that uh, the channels that people tend to spend time on um, for communication are probably short short little bite sized thing. So you're looking at 15 to 30 seconds. I mean, you always hear like, make sure the first three seconds of your ad, you know, um, so you're looking at three seconds, if that, you know, it's a, it, it, and you're fighting for a lot of attention in those, in those, in that time, because it's so quick. So I think a lot of time, because, and especially if we work in, um, if you work in marketing at all, and we have to do anything that has circles around media buys, I feel like sometimes our lives can revolve around some of these social media things um it does start to feel like man people are really dying off <laughs> like their yeah. brains are shrinking or something or smoothing out but um you know it's i would say that uh i think the attention goes other places i think people are you look at people who um look at the look at the attention that it takes to binge watch a show and that's something that everybody does now and that was really nothing that people did not a thing that people did beforehand mm -hmm. um, and people crave that now now in movies like not enough it's like what two hours you know um so i don't think you're wrong i think and when it comes to interaction man interaction is a hard thing because it's so quick right now in 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 it's um people expect a lot out of interaction and uh they expect a lot out of conversion and and i think that's when one of the things that's that can be tough about uh the experience and i'm glad you mentioned that because experience is the whole thing it's not a it's not a wireframe or a design yeah. it's a, it's everything and you know when you're when you're working in those spaces i think people have a tendency to say well anything digital can be tracked so they look uh at digital stuff i say digital that sounds so old but they look at digital stuff as uh, a way to say my dollars are being spent in a way and I can see the return on it. Uh, but then on a broadcast spot, they don't look at it that way. It's like, oh, that's awareness, that's okay. Mm. What, like that was how we used to advertise back then. We weren't tracking how many people were reading. I mean, we knew how many people were reading the newspaper, but it wasn't like digital. It wasn't like 5.2 million. I mean, it wasn't to the, to the eyeball. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I think that lends itself to have a lot of, um, pressure to have things perform and have that be the, the focus. And if you're looking at things to perform on certain channels, you're looking at hyper fast, low attention span, click baby, whatever it takes to get you to go to that next screen type of thing. So I don't think you're wrong. Uh, but I think, again, I think that's one thing that irritates me about how the internet was kind of adapted by print advertisers in that same way. Um, and I work in advertising. I'm not bagging on, on, on advertising um, is because they didn't do it responsibly. Um, it, it's just a, a a banner ad in a magazine is different than a banner ad on a website. Uh, a full page takeover in a magazine is it requires a page turn. It's nothing to a human being to pay, turn a page. But when it's your experience and you're watching something and a full page thing opens up, you're like, oh, you know, yeah. it's a, just a different thing. And so I think because of that, people are like, nope, click, nope, done. Nope. We, we lost a lot of trust with people coming out yeah. of the gate. Um, and I think it's all a lot of that, like what you trying to sell me what, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you said that the intrinsic, 
intrinsic. Um, not saying that right, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, longing for 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 attention for for focus is there. It's just not in in Certain in areas. a digital world. Well, I don't yeah. think that's our fault though. Like, uh. I think that like I can put my phone away and go read a book, and no one's going to interrupt me. But I right. cannot get a single thing done my, during my working day because everyone can email me, they can chat me, they can text me. I'm supposed to be available. Like literally my calendar is blocked out for two days. It says, do not disturb. Do you know what I got done? Jack. Like <laughs> people don't care. They still make meetings even over your meeting calendar. They chat you. Like that's not my fault. It's I have to work in this environment. I have yeah. to work in a place where it's now acceptable to like, chat you or text you at any given time and i'm and i'm and we're essentially like made to feel like we're not doing our jobs if we're inaccessible for some period of time but like when you binge watch tv on a friday night i don't nobody talks to me at all like i'm oh, yeah. just like you're right i don't have to answer my phone it's friday night i'm not working like i'm not i'm in an environment where i have control i think it has yeah. so much to do with the fact that like you don't yeah. have control in this space where we're all now forced to work. We're all yeah. like, I'm a, I have to do creative writing for a website. I have to do it in WordPress on my computer where I have chat, where I have email, where anyone can access me yeah. as opposed to like locking myself in a room with a notebook and my pen, you know, which yeah. is basically yeah. what it's turning into. Yeah. <laughs> I think and, part and, of it and, too, and what's interesting is, um, I 100% agree with you, Luke, is that we've abused the public trust and that has had repercussions. Another thing that I, speaking of like human insight and stuff, if you think about two dominant kind of forms of media, uh, as far as a portion of people's time, let's look at um, you know, like Instagram and a growing one, TikTok. People are not going to these sites uh, for for uh, information or edification, they're going to these sites because they're bored or they're escaping something else, mm -hmm. right? Think about the mindset of somebody when they log onto this platform and, and then, you know, cater to the mindset, like meet someone where they are. I'm not going to Instagram for like in-depth information. I'm not reading the Atlantic on the internet. Exactly. You know, like <laughs> you, have to, you have to meet people where they are. And I think that's one of the frustrating things that you know communicators have to come around on is you know know your medium know why people yeah. are there in the first place so that's I mean, the great... bathroom used to be a quiet space or right. at least where you would read a magazine article yeah. you know like literally now it's completely shifted it's it's funny you say that because i say a lot of you know I'll, I'll, in the ar world people will come with ideas and, and, they'll, and they'll say well you can do that on instagram people use instagram filters the way that they use tiktok filters they use them as edits to tell a story they're not using your filter to sell no one shares ads if yeah. you're sharing an ad it's, it's for ray-ban sunglasses and somebody's hacked your account or you entered a contest, <laughs> sharing entered ads. A contest. <laughs> that's right so 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 and in my world it's like we want to put a logo above their head and i'm like this is the death of the idea you can't do that so if you're on Instagram, AR is like, how do you amplify the person's story? Tell, I want to, if it's for a food, it's like, okay, great. We can say that they're hot, that they're hungry, that their day is hard. How are we helping them tell their story? Cause that's how they're using it. So it's like, you know, it, but in another application, it's like, oh, we want to train someone on how to do something. Great. Let's never use Instagram for that. No one's ever going to use Instagram for that, but it's the same technology. It's still AR. It's the same, it's the same thing, but it's, you want to put that in an app or use a, a more, or use something a different a different execution a different different channel brian i'm genuinely curious like from the from the toy side of thing you're you probably get insight into where things are heading earlier than most of us because your end users are children you know <laughs> And uh, I'm curious if you're seeing any changes in the conventions of like play behavior or what kids respond to or things that like you would have an inside track on that we wouldn't. I'm curious. Um, yeah, and I think it's kind of leaning towards what Luke was saying. Um, 
before how you're going, they're going for the very quick hit um, that will ensure the sale. Um, personally, I, you know, I, I'm offended by that, <laughs> but that's what we're often presented with in these projects as well. We, we want to convey this aspect of, often it's with the licensed products, you know, if it's from whatever, Star Wars or whatever, it's like, we want to capture this key moment in this scene so that the user can relive this, you know, key moment. Uh, and that's, I think, become more and more um, important or more of a driver in the development of a lot of things for at least a certain segment. Um, I, I don't know if it's my aging rigidity of my brain or anything, I find it a little bit sad because it, it just makes it more of a disposable item, even though it's getting more complicated, the items are getting more complicated. You know, the technologies have gotten, as you've probably seen in toys, I mean, pretty darn sophisticated. Mm. You know, okay. micro motors and, and uh, sophisticated electronics What's your opinion on like the uh, the kind of toys where they? I, I can't stand these kind of toys. Not to give you a primer. I know sorry. you're leading. No, I, 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 <laughs> I know totally. Oh my gosh, it's terrible. What a terrible question this was. Um, no, but like the, the kind of toys that are packaged where you can't see what's inside, and it's like gambling, where you say, oh, "I'm gonna." I know, like, yeah, blind box. There's, oh, yeah. uh, there's like what a whole the, the aisle of those kinds of toys. It's freaking now. evil. It's evil, isn't the it? The bunny, the smoking, the smoking rabbits, like. <sighs> It's I know like, I'm. I know I'm aging. Yeah, myself yeah you are. Making that reference. <laughs> it's like they took the idea of the, you know, the, the quarter machine and, and, and blew it out. Yeah, it's it's a product segment. They'll do it with any line, any any line or any product now. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, kids like it. I get you might you know kind of goes back to buying marbles or something. You just don't quite know what you're getting, and uh, it, it reinforces trading, swapping, and yeah. the. Agreed. Surprise. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Competition. Yeah. <laughs> what do they call it? I mean, it's the same principle that a lot of uh, games of chance run on, where it is um, unpredictable reward patterns. Yeah, it's like loot. It's People's like brains loot love boxes. that. Yeah. 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 We like, like to want to fill in with our smorking rabbits, and then you're pissed. But I guess you gotta. <laughs> I guess you're also not a college kid at that point. Yeah, but if you have yeah. a spot yeah. of the other kind, you can you can make a deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a question I have that I, I, a question I have that I think I mean everybody can speak to this because I think it, it speaks to just the evolution that we've all kind of hit on and, and Luke and Nicole and, and Hiram have talked about this too in their works but I think it kind of more so goes specifically to this conversation currently having it with toys is like what like what do you, what is your thoughts on the evolution of the devices or the things that we're we're creating and how things have like I do feel like things were like specifically toys were much simpler back in the day and then that fostered creativity by the end user to imagine what that piece was going to be to them as opposed to to your point like you said they well we want this toy to be this exact scene so they can relive this instead of actually allowing uh you know creativity to arise from that like what is your thoughts on that from toy creation, but also from, I mean, all of you from the, the 3D graphics you're creating, like, do you think there we're losing the ability to, like the younger generations are losing the ability to be creative because we're telling them what creative is as opposed to letting them find it on their own? Or like, what do you think? Before, before the experts speak on that, as a parent, <laughs> as a parent, um, I've, I, you know, my kids have video games, they have really, you know, transformer robots and they have action figures. They all, they got all kinds of toys, but sometimes they'll just play with the box. There'll be an Amazon box that comes in and it's really big and we take the stuff out and they start playing with the bubble wrap and they jump on it and they try and see who, who uh, blows up more bubbles. And then they'll jump in and they'll act like it's a ship and they'll ask me to push them around. So even though they have all these other things that take that supposedly take creativity away from them, they still have it. They still have, they still somehow innately kids can be creative besides that. And, they, and they'll do it with a stick and they'll play like they have lightsabers and they have Thor hammers, but yet they'll get a stick outside and they'll play with that as their swords. And they'll make believe in their heads, despite the fact they have access to all these other more advanced um, toys. Yeah, we're wired for that. 
Uh, I think maybe the a lot of the modern toy market is wiring us maybe just for the purchase. Um, I mean that's the short story of it. Um, I don't I don't condone it. Um, I do find that in the toys uh, that are geared towards younger children that I think creativity is still given room uh, or given more room because the, the toys tend to be less um, uh, less a complete thing. Like, like we were saying, you know, you're recreating this particular scene from Frozen or Mandalorian and, and it, this is it. And it just becomes a thing that sits on the shelf really once you've opened it up and, and once it's talked to you five times, like, okay, I'm done with that. But, but where it's a more open-ended user experience and uh, the child can put themselves into it, that's always going to be a better, better toy. Um, it's super encouraging that the parents are saying that the kids are, are still playing with the boxes and the sticks. That's, uh, that's the hope for the future. That's where we'll get more designers. Except for your own paycheck. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. I know it's true. <laughs> the stick is like out of business yet, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They still need to buy the product to get the box, so it's yeah. still going in anyway. True. Good point. You still got to Amazon that toy. To put I'm not going to name company names, but uh, <laughs> at one place we called ourselves the Pink Landfill Division. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, i'm a little torn on it because i feel like uh i'm, I'm gonna have a daughter here in quite literally about eight days well uh, exciting. congratulations early yes. yeah Girl um, rock. congratulations so my life will be quite different but if we should have done this interview like a month a month later you're, um, you're about to be outnumbered yes yeah might um, still be too young to play with boxes luke just a heads up that's yeah that's probably true <laughs> or, or plastic bags please <laughs> you know when it comes to, like screens and things i'm pretty sensitive to that um i don't want to introduce those things too since too too early and i work with these all the time um i think that uh there's a there can be some suffering if you're prescribing an experience for a child um that feels antithetical to how i grew up um i had and i had the hoth set for star wars and stuff i had stuff that was like that but um but their arms weren't fully articulated if you remember those there was there mm -hmm. they did this um <laughs> but yeah it was uh you know I, I think that there's an interesting thing there because a lot of the stuff i do does bring these toys to life in a, in, a, in an interesting way it can personalize them in, in an interesting way um for kids and um but i do i am sensitive to that it's like well i don't want to it's kind of like when you read a book and you have a, an image of who that character is and, and the, the voice that they have and who they are. And then you see a movie that isn't very good about it. And you're like, this isn't what, what? you know, it, when I read Jurassic Park, I did not picture Sam Neill in that role. He was way too old. Uh, so I saw the movie and I was like, what in the world is this? You know, he shouldn't be dating Laura Dern. Um, so I don't know. It was it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm so torn about it because I feel like in, in one hand, I really like the idea of bringing something that's a little magical and, and expanding things and, 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 um, and giving people experiences. But if you can do it in a way that where people can use their brains or use their, use their brains, hopefully, hopefully that's the goal. <laughs> I like to think our brains are, are big enough and plastic enough that especially with children, they can do both. I hope so. They can enjoy so. the, the thing that, I don't know, everyone else is talking about, you know, all their little peers are talking about, whatever the latest show, movie, whatever it is, video game that they're, they're all excited about and the toys that go along with it. And at the same time, they have their own, their inner life and their inner creativity. I don't think I've seen a child that doesn't have that. And that, that gives me a lot of hope. That's a great note to end on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, I just a positive takeaway. Mic drop. I just want to make just something real quick that I wasn't able to mention before. I didn't want to interrupt, but I am a girl and I have been a fan of comic books since before I started reading. So <laughs> I'm probably not the statistic. <laughs> well, you're particularly but maybe cool why you're such a talented thing. painter. Yeah. 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 Uh, you're an artist and, and even you're, you're female, there's pretty much a chance you'd like comic books at some point. Yeah, yeah. That's the first thing I ever do. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll say that. 
Yeah. And uh, Nicole, I'm also like, a, 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 I have a thing about paint matching. I'm not I'm definitely not as good as you, but <laughs> I try. <laughs> anyway, just, just wanna... keep doing it. Yeah, you just got to keep just looking. <laughs> I want to thank yeah, you guys so you much guys for so spending much. your this, evening this great. with us. This was such a treat and, and it was such a joy to our members and to us. So I thank you for sharing what you do. Thank you for doing what you do uh, and making the world a little bit more beautiful and fun. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks All right. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. For us. Yeah. Take it easy, guys. Everyone have a wonderful great. evening. You All too. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.